Now to the dramatic testimony at a hearing on the Penn State sex abuse scandal. Mike McQuery, the assistant coach, took the stand yesterday and repeated in graphic detail what he saw Jerry Sandusky doing nine years ago in the men's shower. CBS News investigative correspondent Armin Katan is outside the Harrisburg, Pennsylvania courthouse where he heard McQuery testify. And Armin, good morning to you. Good morning, Rebecca. As part of a preliminary hearing for two former Penn State officials charged with lying to a grand jury, Mike McQuarrie told a packed courtroom just what he saw during about 45 crucial seconds at the center of the scandal. Clear commanding voice peppered with lurid detail, Mike McQuarrie never wavered. Mike McQuarrie told all of you in open court today what he said, how specific he was, who he told it to and what he believed was going to happen. It was Friday night, March 1st, 2002, when McQuarrie testified he witnessed the shocking sight of Jerry Sandusky sexually assaulting a boy between the age of 10 and 12 inside a locker room shower. The boy was up against the wall, McQuarrie said. Jerry was directly behind in a very, very, very close position. Jerry was sexually molesting him, having some kind of intercourse with him. McQuarrie said he slammed his locker shut and left the football facility without saying a word, but not before stepping within six feet of the shower. They both turned their bodies totally looking at me, he said. They were four to five feet away. I know they saw me. They looked directly in my eye. McQuarrie said he told head coach Joe Paterno the next morning he had witnessed, quote, a sexual act between Sandusky and the boy. About 10 days later, McQuarrie met with athletic director Tim Curley and senior vice president Gary Schultz, who supervised campus police. McQuarrie, I thought I was talking to the head of police, frankly. I conveyed to them I saw Jerry with a boy in the showers, and it was severely sexual. In a 70-minute cross-examination, defense lawyers repeatedly tested McQuarrie's memory. They also questioned his credibility in and out of court. We believe that at the trial in this matter, the question will be whether Mike McQuarrie has the credibility to, to overcome the perjury high level of proof that is necessary for the Commonwealth. Now, thanks to McQuarrie, Schultz and Curley are headed to trial on perjury charges. Judge William Winter ruling there was probable cause that they had lied about the seriousness of what McQuarrie had told them. Rebecca. Armin Gatayan, thank you. We appreciate it. And for more on the case, we turn now to Casey Jordan, a criminologist and legal analyst. Thank you for being with us. Great Casey, to be good here, morning. Rebecca. Um, so why now at this point would the university or the prosecutors rather be going after these university officials instead of Sandusky? Well, of course, all eyes are on Sandusky. But remember, the allegations that Mike McQuarrie is making, these were observed 10 years ago and they were never reported to the police. And that, according to the prosecutors, Prosecutors really left other children vulnerable. They're going after them not just for the perjury, but for failure to report sexual abuse of a child. Very serious. They want this to, I think, make an example for others that if you are a mandated reporter, you have got to take this to the local DA. Well, yeah, you bring up a point about the fact that, okay, did McQuarrie go far enough in bringing this to the attention of campus security rather than moving it even higher up the food chain? Well, remember, he did exactly what the law required. He reported it to his supervisors. First, he went to Paterno. He described that in great detail yesterday on the stand. And then Paterno said he would take it to Schultz and Curley, which he did. But this is where things get muddy. How much of his story, the one that he told yesterday on the stand, got watered down by Paterno as it got told to Curley and Schultz. Schultz, vice president, but also head of university police, effectively he was making sure it was reported to police at that time. But Schultz never took it the next step and took it to the local DA. What are Sandusky's attorneys? attorneys doing as they listen to this and what are they listening for in McQuarrie's testimony? Well, what we heard yesterday, two hours on the stand, was really a preview of coming attractions, what they can expect when Sandusky stands trial. Remember, they waived the preliminary hearing for Sandusky, mm -hmm. uh, so they didn't get uh, the benefit of hearing all of this. Two things, the content uh, wasn't terribly surprising, although very graphic. I think we were all really impressed mm -hmm. with the incredible detail, the specifics, but also the manner in which it was delivered. McQuarrie was totally
absolutely unflappable. He was confident. And that is something which you can bet will really impress a jury if he delivers the same thing at Sandusky's trial that he said yesterday at the hearing. The defense attorneys for Sandusky have a lot of work to do. So do you think just seeing him testify yesterday makes them even more nervous that this, when it does come to trial for Sandusky, is going to be even more explosive? Well, what they're going to do is absolutely microanalyze, sort of thin slice every single word that he said yesterday. They're already zoning in on that idea that he said he could not be 1,000% mm. sure that what he saw was actually to the level uh, that he reported it to Paterno. The real question is, from yesterday's proceedings, what got lost in translation between McQuarrie, Paterno, Curley, Schultz, and eventually the university president. It gave the, the attorneys a, a preview of what they have to overcome, but it also allows them to really prepare in advance for cross-examining McQuarrie if he gets on the stand in Sandusky's trial. Casey Jordan, thank you so much for being with us. Great we to be here, Rebecca. Have a nice weekend.